Okay, how many know what this is? Who was here last week? There was one word I threw out there. Does anybody remember what that word is? Perspective. Perspective. And I'm going to ask I'm going to ask him again to put Colossians chapter three up there, verses uh, verses one and two in the message. And as we start there, I want to just. And then we talked about, remember the last few weeks, I've talked about 3 John. It says, above all, pray that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And it says, it says here, in, uh, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Jesus Christ, act like you pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from His perspective. See things from His perspective. When it says right here, it says, Don't shuffle along with eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. How many of you here in life can all say we've done that? How many people can say we've been consumed with that? How many here can say that that's easy to do? That's going to say it. it's easier to do than to look at things from Christ's perspective. Can we, also, could we all agree with that? It would probably be easier to say we could all sit here, and I said it last week, we could focus on all of the things that are absorbed with things right in front of us, and we'd probably be here for a couple weeks. But that's not your destiny, what we were designed to do and to be. We were reborn, recreated in the likeness of His Son to rule and reign in life as sons and daughters. So today as we go forward from perspective, the word I want to throw at you, enjoy the love and peace that He's given you. Enjoy. Enjoy. The Lord gave me this here. here. You ever heard, what's a VIP? When you go somewhere and it said, He's VIP, what does that mean? Just as simple as this. How many have ever been to a ball game, got a ticket? You ever been, if somebody gives you a ticket, and when you show up, you got a ticket that says, oh, he's a VIP, come with us. Come with us, and as he comes with, he comes with you, well, you end up finding everything's been provided for because it's on that ticket. What Jesus did for you and me at the cross gave you a ticket that says you are a VIP. You are a very important important person to him you are a very important person to him and he's designed it in such a way that what he wants us to do is look at things from his perspective live life through his perspective not the way the world teaches us to do it but the way that he teaches us to do it in his word that's why i think so many times that in his word it says it says in romans that the law was good the law is holy just and good we all agree with that but let me ask you this. Can the law make you just, holy, and good? All it can do is point out your oil leaks. All it can do is point out your, your hydraulic leaks. It can point out your hair loss. It can point out your faults, failures. But it cannot, it cannot make you just, holy, and good. The only one that cleanses you and makes you whole is Jesus Christ. And when you get a revelation of Jesus Christ, that he's made you just and holy and good, and you get, the, you get this thinking, thinking out, and you start walking in the perspective of who he says you are, you're going to see things different, you're going to live different, and you're going to act different. Amen? Amen? And I want to take your attention to uh, Luke chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 22, and we're going to keep going forward. Perspective. How many want a different perspective? How many want a Christ-like perspective? How many want to live a Christ-like life through the perspective of how Jesus Christ sees you, how what Jesus Christ has provided for you? Or do you want to live a life that says, hey, Sean, I'll just leave this verse up, leave this up here for him. Or do you want to live a life just absorbed with things right in front of you? Because the absorbed with life right in front of you, some of it can be really good, some of it can be really bad. But the point I want to get, if it's good, you're good. If it's bad, you're bad. And another way I'm saying this is if it's good, you're all excited about it. But if it's bad, you carry that identity of the badness in, around with you. And what it does is it affects your will, your mind, and emotions to look at, look at a self-centered response instead of a God-centered response. And when you look at yourself, how many here, man, we're men. 
I'm not gonna, I don't know much about ladies. I'm glad that you're the ones that have to bear children and have to do all these other things. But man, we, we gotta, women got a pecking order too. I don't quite understand that. Don't misunderstand me. So we're not going to go there. But man, every time I've been around men, there's an there's a undercurrent of a pecking order. In knowledge, what you can do, what you can't do, where you've been, what you've seen, what you haven't seen. And, and I don't mean that error, and in an arrogant way, but I have found it's harder. For, girls can get together and, do, and just have a good old time. Guys get together, they don't usually say a whole lot. And then your wife, what you talk about? All oh, women disagree. Unless you're with me. Let me put it this way. Men will talk, but they're not very open with themselves. Men aren't very, don't have heart-to-heart conversations. We all talk about our cars and our trucks and our lawnmowers and our roomy zoom zoom things. We all do the little grunt kind of things. We're more focused on, you know, that's pretty cool. That's pretty, but as far as the heart, heart-to-heart, you know, what's the Lord been doing in your life? What's been going on in your life? You've been going, uh, he, he, I don't know what really, <laughs> you know, that, but things like that will catch a guy off guard because he's more. And what I want you to see, though, is with the father, men is through Christ's perspective is that you can share your heart with him anytime because he wants you. That's part of where you're designed to share your heart with him, to share your heart with him and your spouse and your friends. and your. But what I want you to see that word perspective. And do you remember the example that I gave you last week? My helicopter ride. And about falling off the ladder. Remember, I had my ladder here. But I want you to see that my helicopter ride. I, we we can really be absorbed with right in front of what's right in front of us. But if you'll go and look at through the perspective of Jesus and what He is, you go to a higher height. And and I got this lighthouse here because what does a lighthouse do? It shows you the passage, the way to go. There's rocks. There's things we call life. The things around us. But when we're looking at the perspective through the light, it gives us safe passage. But it doesn't say it won't be a little rough. But we know that we're we know that we're going towards the light. We're going the right direction. Amen. Because we're seeing it from the light, from the perspective of that lighthouse. Who's Jesus Christ? And when we look at Jesus Christ as, as our light, is he going to lead you on crooked paths or straight paths? Straight paths. Straight paths. He's going to lead you to life and life a little bit. Abundance. But abundance. How many here, how many here want abundance? Amen. Amen. Now I told you to turn to Luke 12, 22. And as, and as you read this, I want you to have this. There, nothing here was earned. It says, then God said to his disciples, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor, your, nor, your, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens for neither... For they neither sow nor weep, which have neither storehouse nor barn. And God feeds them. Oh, how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add a cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon, all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about Solomon? Bathsheba had his son Solomon. And what did he pray for? Wisdom. He prayed, when you read it, he prayed for a hearing heart. Because he knew within himself he couldn't do it. And he prayed for a hearing heart. And it talks about all the arrays and how great it was. And here we talk about, we're talking about a lily or a flower. And it says, in all of his splendor, that flower was more, was more than all it's what Solomon was. But I submit to you today, we got a greater one, and his name is Jesus. And we're clothed in a new wardrobe, especially fit for you and for me. Designed by God himself and delivered through his son, Jesus Christ, and sealed through the blood. Hallelujah. If, if then God so closes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown in an oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? 
And do not seek, now this is where I want to go here, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. Everybody look at me. The Father knows what you need of. He is not senile. He's not going, we got to go to plan A, B, or plan B, C, and D because A is not working. Be confident this morning, wherever you're at, whatever's going on, whatever's taking place in your life, the Lord knows what's going on. And I'm going to say it this way. How many here, know, how many here we can all say there's a condition? We, we're in this condition. But I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say this to you. He's not just concerned about your condition. The outside of everything. He's concerned about the condition of your heart and how you see him and how you see things. Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve messed up, it wasn't that they messed up. He, and I'm going to say he was upset or, or, or saddened because they didn't, they didn't see things from his perspective and, and look to him as the answer. And then when the enemy, this is a cool one, when, when, the enemy, when, when God spoke to the enemy, he, he talked to them right in front of Adam and Eve. Right in front of Adam and Eve. Then we go over to the New Testament when Jesus is talking, when Jesus is, the Pharisees come up with the woman called in adultery. And what does he say? He said, man, we're going to, he says, he who's without sin. And we know that the story leads, but here's one word that, uh, that's brought me back up was Jesus looks at them and says, woman, where are thou accuser? I'll bring that up later. But where are thou accusers? And she says, I do not know. And what do you tell her? Neither do I condemn you. Go and, go and sin no more. So Jesus didn't come to sit here and accuse you and I of all our faults and failures. But he came here to redeem us and set us free. And if you go around life thinking that the Lord doesn't, he doesn't see what's going on or doesn't see your needs or doesn't see what's happening... If, he, if you go around with that mindset, what are you looking at? You're looking at yourself and what you can do and right, what's right in front of you. Are you hearing me this morning? What is right in front of you? I'm here to tell you, if you look at what's right in front of you, you'll wear yourself out and you'll get nowhere. You'll wear yourself out and get nowhere. How does Christ see you? What, how, let me ask you this. The perspective, I'm using the word perspective. How does he see you? Would you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He sees you in Christ. He sees you sealed, set free and delivered. And I said this a week or two ago. It says, it says, in, it says in the last days that there will be people that take the mark of the beast. And what happens to those that take the mark of the beast? They're condemned. They're done. It's a done deal. Now, do we all believe that? Who believes that with me? All right. How many here want to take the mark of the beast in here? Nobody. Why? Because we know it'll seal our fate. And we don't want that fate. Are we agree? And we don't want anybody to seal, have that fate as well. Is that right? So we, 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 we show them that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. But here's the thing. We believe. Does anybody doubt that? Now it says when you received Jesus Christ, you were sealed. You were sealed. And you know what a seal is in the old days? You ever, ever watch one of those movies in the old days? They take a, a, a signet ring, and they get that little hot wax, and they write a little letter, and then they stick it in there, and they stick it in that letter. What's it do? It seals it. It seals it. You and I, when you receive Jesus Christ, you've been sealed into his family. You've been sealed into the kingdom of a son of whom he loves. You've been sealed in and set free, and it should bear witness through the Holy Spirit. I'm one of his kids. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to enjoy the love that he has for me. See, some of us in life, we're not enjoying the love that he has for us because we're trying to earn it or we're so absorbed with everything else and all of our needs that we can't see. We can't see through all that because we're not resting. We're laboring for what? For what? To get nowhere. We're working real fast, wearing ourselves out, and we're not getting nowhere. It's kind of like being on a walker. One of them electric. Boy, we were going a long ways today. A treadmill. I don't want to be on a treadmill. I want to live life. I want to get out and see the birds, see life, enjoy it. 
Look at the perspective. Now we'll go on here. When we back up at verse 20, nor have an anxious mind. How many here have had an anxious mind? I, I would tell you right now here and there, probably everyone in this room in some way, shape, fashion, or form has, has an anxious mind. Just today. How many of you have an anxious mind? What about, we're going to leave church tomorrow, today. <laughs> we're going to leave church. Going to go throughout our day, do whatever plans you got. And then, this, then tomorrow, or then this evening, you're going to start doing what? Getting geared up for tomorrow. Yeah. Nothing wrong with getting geared up for tomorrow. But then you're going to start, how many of you might be getting anxious? Now, anxiety, I'm going to tell you, Anxiety can be a good thing and a bad thing. But most of the time, anxiety, I know years ago, Rick had me to run in his race boat. And the first time, I've been driving boats, driving boats, driving, but now I'm going to race. And this thing is wop, 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 make my hair stand up. Well, the first time we go to race, I used the restroom 100 times. I couldn't even sit. Those guys all wanted to talk. And I was, I'm sitting there doing this and. Rick's concerned about the advertisement and everybody making sure we, we do a good job, which, which we did. But I was so anxious that I couldn't even talk to anybody all day. And I laid in the back seat of my pickup truck, hot and sweaty, and I'd read my Bible to try to relax. And then I, I got to go to the bathroom again. And then, and then they had those uh, them porta potties. And I'm going to tell you, I ain't found one yet that I like. I haven't found one that I like, and I don't like being in them very long. But for that day, I got to be in them. You could just put Dan on the board, on the door and said, this is Dan, because the anxiety. And I went through that whole day, and you know what happened? We didn't even get to race. <laughs> well, then after that, all the hairs, all the little hairs that I had in my chest come out. Ding, da, ding, 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 ding. You know, how come we can't race? I'm ready to go. <laughs> you, you see how we get all anxious? But, and that's just a, a, I'm going to tell you that's a little silly thing, but we can apply that to other areas. How many get anxious? Some, a relative goes in the hospital. A dad, a father, and so as I'm saying, some of those things are normal because our heart breaks for, for them. But I, what, what I want you to see is, but when you get so wrapped up in that anxiety, you, you lose out the perspective of everything else around you. And it's hard to enjoy the birds and see this and do that and, 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 and reflect on how much he loves you because you're so anxious. Now, in another term, you're getting a new job, you're getting a new thing, you're doing new things, you're getting a new car. There's an anxiety of excitement. So what I'm saying is it's not a bad thing to be anxious, but what I'm saying is don't let it wear your mind out. Don't let it wear your mind out. And it says here in the next verse, For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And everybody say to me, added. Added. All these things shall be what? Added. So the Father knows what you need of, but he's not interested in, the, in what you, he's interested, but he's more interested that you're seeking him and his way of doing things and seeing things from his perspective and trusting and believing and relying on him. And he says, when you get to where, I'm not going to put this on a condition, but what I want you to see is his desire is that you seek the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Now, if you, if you know, if you're confident in where you're standing, where your standpoint is with God, that's the right, the right standing with God has been, been purchased through the blood of Jesus. Now you got righteousness, joy, and peace. Now I'm going to tell you, if you got righteousness, joy, and, joy, and peace in your life, you're going you're to have a smile. And there's another part in the Bible where it says, when tribulation and troubles and things come your way, don't let that stop you. Don't let that hinder you. Don't let that slow you down. Rejoice because you know you're in Christ Jesus. Rejoice because you know you've been redeemed. Rejoice because he's the lighthouse that's leading you on the path that's going to direct it and it's going to be a safe path because he's the one shining the light on, way to go, on the way to go. Amen. Amen. So part of seeking, seeking the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added. I like the word added. Amen. Added. So let me ask you this, or you don't have to raise your hand, but... 
I'm going to walk into this thing. <laughs> Time I turn around and see. The, the point as we go forward in, in here is Jesus is about saving our lives. He's concerned about saving our lives, but not just saving our lives for an eternal day, but he's saving our lives for every day. For every day. For every day. And look at the perspective that he has. He has given you life. I mean, where's the verse? That say? There's a verse of the Bible that says he gives you all things that pertain to life and seek ye first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. Then we had to, he gives you all things that pertain to life and godliness. So who gives it to you? He does. What did it cost you? What did it cost you? Nothing. What did it cost him? It cost him everything because of how much he loves you because you are a VIP. You are a VIP. Doesn't matter what side of the street you came from. I don't, doesn't matter what kind of house you live in or don't live in. You are a VIP in his eyes. Doesn't matter whether you drive a Dodge, Chevy, or Ford. Men, you're a VIP in his eyes, not based on the vehicle that you drive. Be thankful you got one. <clears throat> Be thankful you got one. And we've heard, this, we've heard this all so many times. Seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Everybody say give. give. Me. Give. The kingdom. So it's his good pleasure to give you righteousness, joy, and peace. Isn't that pretty cool? It's his good pleasure to give you righteousness, joy, and and peace. How many here could use a little more righteousness, joy, and peace? <laughs> but see what happens in our condition. In the condition, a lot of times, is we focus on that condition on the outside, but in reality, it affects us on the inside. But when the God, when I want to say, how many see the world? We've heard this a lot of times. We see the world. Is the world full of need? World full of world's full of needing a lot of things. Even in this in this nation that we live in, sometimes you know we've lived here so long, we get a little complacent with it. But you still run across I run across people and that that still declare this is the greatest nation on the planet, and they're doing everything they can do to get here. So no, even no matter how bad it might look to us, it looks real great to those that live somewhere else. So what I'm trying to say is we don't realize how good we got it. And even in the good, the gospel, the good news, you don't realize how good you got it in his son, Jesus Christ. It's his good pleasure to give you righteousness, joy, and peace. It's his good pleasure. The word give. Give. He didn't say earn. He didn't say deserve. He didn't say work for. It's his good pleasure to give it to you. And it's his good pleasure to give it to you that it, he, he thought of you so much that he gave, that his son gave everything he had. And I remember reading there where it says, if this past, take this cup from me. What was that cup? That he was going to drink all the sins of the world. Not just for, not just for that day, but, but for the future of my kids, kids, and my kids, 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 kids. He bore all the sins of the world at that moment for you and for me. Nailed it to the cross. So that, because it was his good pleasure to give us access to the kingdom through his son, Jesus Christ. Woo! And if we'll grab things from his perspective, we'll grab things from his perspective. We'll live life from the perspective of what his word says. Let's go over to Colossians. Uh, let's go back over to Colossians. Don't be absorbed. How many here can say, I've been absorbed with things right in front of me? We can all say that. Don't, don't belittle yourself. I always tell people, be honest with yourself. Because when you're honest with yourself, you can ex we'll expose the things that aren't right, and God will always make it better. Right. Amen? We try to hide all that stuff, but how many... Uh, it's the Father's good pleasure. I want you to see. Enjoy what He's given you. Don't get so wrapped up and get your head so... What, is confusion of, of God or the devil? Does he, you don't get a rose or a flower like the old Popeye movie, the old Brutus, she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. And then he gave her watch the old, that's a goofy movie, but I always grew up with Popeye. And you get to the end of, the, the end of it, and they got, he's got the one where it says, she loves me not. And he looks around to everybody, and he goes, where was I? And they're all going, with Brutus, and, and he, they go, 
she loves me not. So he looks at, hey, she loves me. And everybody's hopping and hipping and carrying on. Because <laughs> they, were, they were afraid of Brutus. And then here comes little old wee wee Popeye comes around the corner with big old tall olive oil. And he sees that this isn't going very well for him. And everybody scatters. I don't know why I'm going there, but anyhow. Everybody scatters, but out of fear, said everybody out of fear of what Brutus might do. And then he, then he whoops up on Popeye, but Popeye gets his spinach and has the last say. Okay? He, you might feel like little old wee me, but you've been given the spinach of the Holy Ghost in through Jesus Christ, and you always have the last day, and everything that the enemy's tried to bring against you, the Father's already disarmed and taken out by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, and, what, and He has purchased and given you life and life abundantly. He's given you things that pertain to life and godliness. Look at it through His perspective and see that you can enjoy all that He's given you freely. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Colossians there, and I'm going to, well, we're going to close there maybe. We're all having a good day. And if we, everybody know where Colossians is? It's after Ephesians, I believe. It's after one of them. We're going to go to Philippians or Ephesians in a minute. And let's turn, let's turn all the way over. Let's turn all the way to verse 12 of chapter 3. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, holy and beloved. Now remember I said, remember I said, how are you holy? Are you holy because of how good you are, Aaron? How, how good your wife thinks you look? I ain't going to say how good you look. How are you holy? Because of Jesus. You hear that? As God's elect, that's you and me. When you receive Jesus, you're a VIP. Okay? Holy and beloved. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. Boy, there's a big one right there, forgiveness. Well, that's easy to do. I see a whole bunch of people smiling. It's quiet in here. I'm going to tell you, forgiveness is something that's part of the good news of Jesus Christ is because of through Him, you can forgive. Through Him, you can live life as you did. How many people have you run across that have held on to the root and bitterness of, of unforgiveness? And when you hang on to that root of unforgiveness, guess what? It will, it will give you that anxious mind. It will let you focus on nothing but what's right in front of you, and it will absorb all of who you are and rob the very strength that you've been given for that day because you're all focused on that unforgiving, that unforgiveness. So I encourage you, if you harbor an unforgiveness, and I don't need to know all the circumstances and situations, but when you learn to forgive that person or to forgive those for those things, it will benefit you. It will change you around from the inside out. It will change your heart. It will change your heart. And I can tell you from experience, that's probably one of the toughest things I've had to do is forgive. Forgive. Over and over. I remember one time, short story, a person I knew didn't like very well. They were living for the devil, and I was fine with that. <laughs> and one day they came to me, and they wanted to know about Jesus. And they're right there, and they're living wherever we were. We got to hold hands and lead them to Jesus. And boy, how excited they were. And how excited I should be. And I really was excited. But now, before when they were living for the devil, I knew where they were and how to identify them and to stay away from them. Not in that, in that sense. But when they got saved or born again, guess what? They wanted to hang out with me. And, dude, and I didn't like that very well because I didn't really care for them. 
And I'm not trying to, but in myself, I was looking, I want to say, I was selfish and looking at myself and looking at my hurt and looking at my pain and looking at the circumstance. I was absorbed with that and I couldn't see what Jesus had done in their life because I was more focused on the hurt and the pain that they did to me. And it became one of those things when they'd sit there and look at me or sit here and look or, or go somewhere that I had to learn to forgive them not in myself, but through Jesus Christ. And when I learned to forgive them, that broke that wall or that broke that deal that was keeping me from seeing and experience all the love that he had for me. Because I might have, somebody might not like me that way. But that shouldn't give them, that doesn't merit my right for them not to accept Jesus Christ. Everybody has an equal opportunity. Everybody. Everybody. It says that he wishes that how many perish? None, but all. Come into repentance and change the way they live and do and come into the understanding who Jesus is. Okay, here we go. Forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against his brother, go and tell Jimmy. Not me. So if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. So is it important for you to forgive? There's some life. There's life in learning and walking in forgiveness. So I encourage you today, I don't know why, what, why the Holy Spirit's telling me that. If you're harboring unforgiveness, if you're harboring unforgiveness and bitterness, today is the day. Let it go in Jesus. You might not know how. Let it go. And as you let it go, I promise you, if you're willing to let it go, the peace and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit will cultivate and nourish and bring peace and harmony to your, to your heart. To your heart. Amen. Amen. Forgiveness, go. Forgiveness. I thought that didn't sound right. Forgiveness, go into the hearts of your people today. If anyone's not, if anyone's just harboring forgiveness, Father, I lift them up to you right now. I pray for the power of your love and your mercy that is fresh and new every day to, to continue to equip them as they speak, as they step out with that forgiving. Something that might have been done that, Father, you'll begin to transition, to begin to rearrange. And, the Father, you'll take that burden. You'll take that, that heaviness that they might feel. It'll be releasing them right now. It'll release in them right now. And that, Father, you'll, you'll just take that spot, that spot and fill it with your love and fill it with your compassion and fill it with your mercy and fill it with your wisdom. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 14 says, but above all these things, put on love. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Woo, you're a VIP. VIP, when you walk in love, guess what? There's a bond of perfection. What's his name? Jesus. You're the lighthouse that points the way to Jesus. The bond of perfection. What's bond? Do you ever remember that guy? Some of you guys remember the guy used to wear the hard hat and hang on the eye beam Come TV commercial, the super glue commercial. Do you remember? I don't remember it. Can you tell me about it? And held on to his hard hat. Would anybody here like to reiterate that, redo that for us? We'll go out here in the church along the highway. Would anybody be willing to do that? Now yeah, we're going somewhere here. Verse 15 and 16 is where we're going. Watch this. Now we've talked about seek first the kingdom and all these things will be what? Everybody say added. 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 To me. Okay. And the verse 15 says, and let. Everybody say let. let. The peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. So what part of this seeking, part of going and growing in life, is you got to learn to let, let the person in the body in, in the, uh, of Jesus Christ, let his peace rule and reign in your heart. There's a letting. You know, when we, verse uh, Ephesians 2, 8 says, Grace, you're saved by but you don't stop there. It says saved by grace through faith. So we've been given the grace, but it comes, it comes to us through faith. 
faith in believing that Jesus is all that he says he is and has done all that he says he could do and that he has saved you and cleansed you and wiped you clean and made you a new person. The grace has been provided, but faith is what is the one that activates it and lets it grow in your life and, and become a, a fruitful tree of life, if I could say it that way. Faith and grace. You can't have grace. Grace is there, but you don't access it unless you got faith. Faith is what makes it activate in your life. And it says in here, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You're going to have, when you begin to, there's a, a I'm going to say, you know, read Hebrews. If you all look through the book of Hebrews, it says, let, therefore, let us, therefore, let us, let us, let us, let us, let us. Based on a response to what Christ has done in our lives, let us, let us. Based on what Christ has done in your life, let the peace of God, it says, rule, rule. And if you look in the uh, Amplified, it says, let, let the peace of God be the umpire. In your life, who knows what an umpire does? He calls the shots. Does anybody trump the umpire? This is an instant replay. We got to look at this again. What I want you to see here is there's a part, a part of growing in Christ and who you are and seeing things per, per, from his perspective is you got to be willing to let him Rule and reign in your heart. You've got to let him do that. I can't make you do that. You, yourself, you, right where you're at, you, yourself, you have to come to the point where you want to let him, let his peace rule and reign in your heart. Let his peace reign in your heart. So just like in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, man wasn't created. I'm going to say it this way. Man was not created to take care of the garden. Man, the garden was created to take care of man. And what, what we call that, the garden of, don't all shout at once, the garden of Eden. Eden means paradise. Jump all the way over. Was it meant for man to toil or tend? Were you just, were you, were, was Adam designed to toil in that garden? And I'm going to give, well, that doesn't apply to us now. When Jesus was on the cross, and there was two, two people on that cross, one said, if you're, if you're who you say you are, get us down from here. And the other one said, hey, we're here because we deserve to be here. But this man is innocent. And, he's, and, that, man says, and that man says, remember me. Basically, he was saying, I believe in you. And what does Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Today, you'll, what he was declaring, part of what I want you to see, what he was declaring is today that what you've been told, what, what men have had to toil for and try to earn and try to get, no longer are they going to have to do that. He was, I want to say we could correlate the Garden of Eden with him saying, today you'll be with me in paradise because what he was saying was, I'm going to make a way and I'm going to make a door that when you go in, you're going to sup with me and you're going to find life and see that it's a good life. And see that it's a great life. And what man was designed to do, not toil for it, but tend to it. Too long, and I don't like to say too long, too long we've been toiling to try to earn God's love. Too long we've been trying to live in, in a love that's been given to us freely. Too long we've been trying to achieve things that's been already given to us. Amen. Too long. I don't know about you, but I want to I get to a place I want to get to this place where when I don't just let the things in front of me make out who I am and make out what's going to happen. That's good. You got a daughter getting married, don't you? Huh? Congratulations. I'm happy for you. But it's all on you, buddy. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Don't misunderstand. I got two kids. I know exactly what this where I'm. You know where I'm going with this? Hmm? It's all on you, buddy. Congratulations. The point I'm going to get, he might have an anxious mind. <laughs> He's going to say everything in front of him. Instead of being excited about his daughter, he's going to be freaking out. How am I going to get this all done? I'm prophesying right now to you because the Lord's telling you. Okay. 
what, what, what I believe in my heart is don't be concerned about those things, but focus your perspective on Christ Jesus and believe that he's going to open up the doors and going to make all the ways for everything to flow like a well-oiled machine. Amen. Are you following me with that this morning? But he could sit there and look back and go, this is all, you're in this too. Don't misunderstand me, Ma. You're just, just keep sitting like that. We got you covered. We don't call 911. We call Brendan. But the point is, if we wait for that perfect moment to arise, you'll wear yourself out looking for it. Yeah. The point I want to get to is you've got to be willing to let with the, with the gospel of the good news, the message of Jesus Christ, you've got to be willing to let it come in and resonate and take up residence in your heart that says that he's given me the kingdom and I'm looking to him and I'm looking at it through his perspective and I'm going to live the life I was designed to live like Romans 5.17 that I reign through the one Jesus Christ. He's the one that opens and closes the door. He's the one that makes way. He's the one that sustains me. He is my substance. He is my life. I'm looking at life through him. I'm not absorbed with what's right in front of me because he gives me the power over what's right in front of me. He's disarmed all that has tried to come against me, and I'm going to walk in that power in Jesus' name. Amen? And I've already got to this one. Here we go right here, 16. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Let, 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 let. Everybody say let. Let, let it dwell in you. How much? Richly. richly. What does richly mean? Just a little bit? Abundance. Abundance. Overflowing. There's a purpose in that. There's a purpose. When you're willing to let it. Let me ask you this. We'll close right here. How many here have read, a lot of times read the Bible? What I want you, what you to see is, how many here have been afraid to read the Bible? How many have been, I'm going to say afraid, maybe it confuses you. But I want to inspire you to be excited to read your Bible. But every time you read it, read it through the, read it through the eye, when I say read it through you, read it through the perspective that it was designed for you to read about Jesus Christ and all that he's given you. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When, see, there's things that you read you might not know or understand, but as you begin to let it dwell in you abundantly and richly, he'll begin to connect all the dots. He'll begin to bring it all together. But if you don't have it in you richly, there's not a way to conduct, you're not going to be able to conduct, not going to be able to draw the line from A to B. Okay? But I don't know about you, but I want to be able to connect the line from A to B. I don't want to live just the mediocre, go to church on Sunday. We talk about Jesus on Monday and forget about him until next Sunday. I want him to be part of everything I do in my life. Just like you're getting ready to get, get, get your, you're going to get married with your daughter. She's going to marry, get married. But don't let the perspective, don't come from the perspective of how I'm going to do all these things. Come for the perspective, because here's what happens in life is when things are not going our way or when we have a different perspective, we are absorbed with us in front of us, we start to believe and start to declare that the blood and the body and the person of Jesus Christ isn't, isn't good enough or big enough, that our situations or our conditions or those other things that we're, we, start to, we start to declare or start to do, that they're bigger than who Jesus Christ is. Or, or we walk around going, peace, where are you? Wisdom, where are you? Knowledge, where are you? Or, Jesus, do you not care? Has anybody ever said that? I've said that. But, as, but the more I find that we absorb ourselves in this word, the more that we let it rule and reign in our hearts. It, you know, you read, put Romans 5.5. 5. Okay, this is right where we're, <laughs> Romans 5.5. 5. Watch this. And we'll close right here. Did you hear my words? Close right here. Amen, amen brother. I get Amen. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen. Hope does not disappoint. Hope, expectation of good does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out not in our brains but in our hearts. Amen. In our hearts. In our hearts. By what? The Holy Spirit. And what was given it to you? Was given it to you? Was given to you. Think about that. The Holy Spirit. 
I believe the one that was hovering the earth when God said what was, what was formless and void. The Holy Spirit went. Pfft. That same Holy Spirit's been given to you. But not just given. It says it's been poured out in your hearts. I don't know about you and being poured. There's a lot to say in something. being When you pour something, I mean like being poured. Randy, you're doing good. You're a good daddy. You got to go change a diaper? You're on your own. Good. <laughs> and here's where we're going to close, is when you look to Jesus, when you look to Jesus from things from his perspective, and you let his peace rule in your heart, and you let the wisdom and the knowledge of his word that's been poured in you through the love that he has for you, you will not be disappointed. Because it will give you a hope that says, I can do this. It will give you a hope that says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It will give you a hope that says he gives me all things that pertain to life and godliness. It will give you a hope that says I can see life and live good days in the land of the living. It will give you a hope that says it's his amazing grace through my faith in Jesus Christ that's remade me and given me a new suit and a new wardrobe in and through the body of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go forward in life with a new perspective. I'm not going to be absorbed with this, everything in front of me. Because I can tell you, it's easy to get absorbed with everything in front of us. And I'm not saying that you ignore what's right in front of you. But what you do is you take what's right in front of you and you look at it through, the, you look at it through Christ's perspective. You look at it through His perspective. Does He love you? Do you believe that He loves you? Do you believe, now I'm going to, I'm going to, do you believe that you're good enough? How many of you ever, uh, just don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have ever felt they're, they're not good enough, though? Their past is hunting them down. Their present may be hunting them down. But see, when you have an experience and a revelation with Jesus, he changes that all around. And he takes the simple things of life. He fed, he fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. He could have just said, I'm hungry. The boy showed up and said, hey, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> I'm going to eat it. <laughs> he could have done that and said, they're on their own. But he said, he had compassion on all those people. He had compassion. And I'm going to tell you this. I already said that, so I can't say that. But I'm going to tell you this. When I was, I'm reading it back to the accuser. Remember I told you, where thou woman, where's our accusers? When you're in Christ Jesus, you no longer Standing on people standing, you're no longer acu being accused. You're no longer being condemned because the blood of Jesus has made you worthy and good and whole and just. Are you hearing that this morning? It's no longer designed to point out your flaws, no longer designed to point out your, your oil leaks or the cracks in your tires or the hole in your roof. Because he didn't come to condemn you. He came to depart in you that you are a VIP. And you've been given, you've been given every ticket of the freedom to enjoy life. And we can use it the game of life, however you want to say that. And sometimes you might have to ride on the elevator. Sometimes you might have to get an extra. But learn to let. Everybody look at you. Let. Let. Let the peace of God. You have to be willing to let it rule and reign in your heart. He's not going to just do it for you. How I say this? He's already done it for you, but he's not going to force you to walk in it. You have to be willing to let. So when you begin to let his wisdom and knowledge, and when you seek after, I'm good, I'm great, I'm wonderful, not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus is in me. And it says, these things will be, he knows what you need of. He knows what you need of. But don't be anxious in your mind about those but look at it through my perspective and seek me. And as you seek me, these things will be added unto you. Added unto you. He's already purchased and paid for it. He's already done what he's going to do. Now what he wants you and me to do is to let the person of Jesus Christ and who he is begin to permeate out of who we are and what we are. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. To some, you're peculiar. <laughs> to others, you're just plain weird. Let it dwell.
dwell in you richly, that he loves me, that he cares for me. When we take communion, we have it over here, we have it every Sunday. We do it, we've been learning, trying to take it once a month. When you take communion, you celebrate, it says, do this in remembrance of me, that his body was broken so that mine could be made whole. And we, and we celebrate his blood that was shed, that his blood that was shed was so that it was sealed and locked and signed and delivered for my freedom and my redemption. And we remember that because it's not in ourselves, but it's everything that he did for you and for me. Everything he did for you and for me. But he doesn't leave us in the rest of this world to figure out to live, to live as orphans. He gave us the Holy Spirit poured in our hearts that as we look to him, as we draw from his perspective, that we'll see the light. It's high above. It'll show us the way to go when the rocks are right in front of us. We'll see that we can go right around it because there's the light. There's the way I'm supposed to go. Forgive! Do you see that? And you'll see, and you'll come to safe harbor, safe and secure. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. Father, I thank you and I praise you. And as we go forward today, you know the blueprints of their heart, you know the areas of their life, you know the conditions of things that are happening. And Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that there'll be a letting, a letting of your peace rule and take residence in their hearts. That they'll say, Father, this has happened and this has happened, this has happened and that has happened. But I want to look at it from your perspective. You love me. You care for me. You designed for my, de my destiny to rule and reign in life, not for life to reign and to rule me, but that I would be the one that would rule and reign in it through the one, Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray this morning as there's a letting, and as there's a letting in their heart, as there's a willingness to say, Father, fill me to overflowing. Fill me to overflowing. I, I desire for you to come in. That Father, that peace, that peace, that peace, that peace will slow that anxious mind. That peace will bring comfort and a hope of an expectation that you, you are the source, the wellspring of life. And that they can depend on, they can look to you, they can be pers they are persuaded and convinced and absolutely sure. I thank you, Father, for doors being opened in their life as they let your peace rule and reign in them, as they let the word of God richly dwell in them, that though you'll be able to connect the dots, A and B. And they'll be able to see the light shining, not the rocks and not the, the, the calamity, but they'll see the light shining and that they can go right around that effortlessly because they're walking in your light. I pray for favor to rule and reign in their life. I thank you, Father, for peace to rule and reign. I thank you for direction to rule and reign. I thank you for doors that are opening, not based on how good they are, but based on how good you are. And Father, I pray that you lay it in their hearts. You lay it in their hearts for day after day and week after week that they are VIP in your eyes. That they are VIP in your eyes. V -I VIP. And I thank you, Father, that our families continue to multiply and continue to flourish. I thank you, Father, they're blessed going in and coming out. That they're always at the head and never at the bottom. That, Father, as they go, that they know that you've given them all things that pertain to life, to life and godliness. They were designed to live solid and true in you. And, Father, we thank you for Jesus. I want to invite you this morning to... If you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life or you just never said, Father, I believe that Jesus did it all for me. He did it all for me. Today is your day when you can simply say, just simply say, I believe that Jesus, Jesus did it all for me. I believe in his death, burial, and the resurrection that he went through so that I could, that I could be set free. If you believe that this morning, you believe that this morning, you're a son and a daughter of the Most High. Enjoy your sonship. Enjoy the authority given to you. Enjoy the peace that you were designed to reign in. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Father. And Father, I pray across this room, if anyone is, is uh, sick, not feeling very well, some type of affirmity, we come against, everybody just agree with me, we come against the affirmities and sicknesses that you purchased and paid for, you took it upon yourself so that we, our bodies could be made whole. So I speak wholeness from the top of their head to the soles of their feet in every area of their life. In every area. And I thank you, Father, that it manifests, that healing power manifests in them now. In Jesus' name.